Hello friends, so this is the sixth lecture on Sir Philip Sidney's An Apology for Poetry. In our last lecture we saw the three kinds of imitations. The first one is imitating the inconceivable excellencies of God like David's Psalms or Solomon's Song of Songs. And then we saw matters of philosophy, second kind, <coughs> that is uh, supernatural or supernatural, that is metaphysics. And thirdly, we saw right poets is imitating in the form of elegy, in the form of lyric, in the form of tragic, in the form of comic, in the form of heroic, in the form of epic, and in the form of tragic comic. Sunday. Now, uh, today, what we are going to consider is well, how important is versing and rhyming in poets? Versing and then we are a versing and rhyming. Will versing and rhyming make a poet a poet or someone a poet? He say according to Sir Philip Sidney, he said that there are poets who have never versified and there are poet, there are poets who have versified but not poets. There are poets, you, you consider those persons or those writers as poets but have never versified or never used to rhyme. But on, on, the, other, on the other side you can find there are many people who have versified, used to rhyme but are not accepted as poets. So, rhyming and versing will not make a person a poet. Example he gives is uh, Xenophon's Cyrus. Xenophon's. We have come across this Cyrus. The just king. The just king. That is in Latin we say, Ephigim justi imperii. Ephigim. This is given in the text. Ephigim. Ephigim justi. Sorry. Justi imperii. Imperii. So these are, we have got English words from this. Justi means just. Justi. In Latin, I and J can be interchanged. They are interchangeable. Justi, or they can also write it as a Justi. Understand? Means just, you can already see just. Just and right. Imperi, you have got the English word imperial. Imperial that is connected to emperor. So that imperi. Effigy, effigy, you know. People burn the effigy of leaders and so on when they get angry with them. Effigy. So, effigy, justi, imbedi means the portraiture of a just emperor. The portraiture of a just emperor. And this has been done by, this is about the Cyrus, the emperor Cyrus. Emperor Cyrus, it has been said that he was such a just person, a just emperor that he just and right, that he even respected those people whom he conquered and treated them with the dignity, great dignity. That's why he is called Ephigium or the portraiture of a just emperor. Now the whole thing has been written by Xenophon, not in words, no rhyme is used, but prose. Of course, it is poetic prose. Therefore, versing and rhyming, they do not, they do not make a, a writer a poet. And uh, Sidney gives further example. He says, just because you put on a long gown, you will not become a lawyer. Lawyers put on long gowns, but just by putting on, you could, you don't become a lawyer. Just by just by putting on a overcoat and a tie. <coughs> Pants and shirt, you don't become shoes, socks, and all those things. You don't become a professor or a lecturer. See, that is outward. That is something outward that you see. So, a long gown 
will not make you a lawyer exactly like that. The outward, that is, rhyming and embracing will not make you a poet. But the, on the other hand, if you plead in armor, armor means suppose you are putting on the uh, uh, putting on the uniform of a soldier, and you are going to the court and pleading your case, you are a lawyer. That is the thing. What is important is the call. What is in, in, important is the inner stuff. That is what the, I hope that the example is very clear to you. Isn't it? Example. Now again you can see another example given here is Herodotus. Herodotus the historian and uh, the writer of romance, for example. Herodotus, he says, he wrote the romance of Theogenes and uh, Chariclea. Herodotus, Herodotus, Greek, Theogenes, Theogenes and Chariclea. Chariclea. These names are there in the text, you must read the text. My lecture is not a substitute for the text. Original text should be read by each and every one of you. To enjoy, the imbibe the beauty of the text, the beauty of the language. Understand? Yeah. So, Herodotus, Theodemus, and Chaitlia, a great romance. The whole thing is written in prose. Understand? The picture, prose. The picture of love in Theodemus and Chaitlia is but done in prose, not in rhyming and versing. But still, you can see, it is considered as a great poet. The author has put on the mask of a poet. Therefore, please note this point. In the exam, sometimes you will get a question like this, a short question like this. What, what is the opinion of Sir Philip Sidney on rhyming and versing? The answer is, Rhyming and versing will not make you a poet. Then, example given is that of Herodotus and also a son of an, son of an Cyrus and Herodotus, uh, Theogenes and Chaitri. Understand? Yes. And then what is it after all? It is that, he says. It is that. And what is that? Feigning notable images of virtue. That is, that is what makes you a poet. It is that feigning, feigning means feigning, imitating, notable, notable images of virtue. Feigning notable images, notable images of virtue. See, it is that feigning notable images of virtue Vices, virtue and also vices, for example, in the yoga, it is the vices. Or what else? Or what else he has? What else? With that delightful teaching. Or what else? What else means anything? Or what else? Or what else? That with that delightful teaching. With that delightful teaching. So did you see Horace here? The ghost of Horace is here, present here. The present ghost of Horace. Horace, that is the pronunciation, but some people pronounce it as a Horace. Horace, this is the pronunciation, Horace. You can look up the dictionary and see. <coughs> but some people pronounce it as Horace. Okay. That doesn't matter because if you can communicate, see, that is. Okay, that is. So, it is that feigning notable images of virtue vices, or what else? What else means anything with that delightful teaching. So, for us, the formula is utile et dulce. Utile et dulce, useful, that means teaching, with sweetness, dulce means delicious, the English word, utility, the English word comes from here, 
And Gould said, delicious, sweet. Jilebi is delicious. But the sugula is delicious. Suppose Jilebi and the sugula they are bitter. Who will eat it? Who will eat it? No one will eat it. <laughs> Isn't it? So, you have to, if you want, if you want to attract somebody towards you, you should be sweet. You, your speech should be sweet. Means friendly. Only in a friendly situation, you can teach somebody. Understand? There has to be student and teacher. There has to be what we call a an understanding. And that understanding is love. That is famous philosopher, British philosopher, you know. Yeah, Russell said. What did Russell say? You remember? In some other lecture, I, I have quoted this. The educator should love the young. That is the first quality of an educator. The educator should love the young. Otherwise, you won't, you will not, you cannot teach. Some are always angry like Achilles with the bow and the arrow. You are standing like this. Nobody is going to see. Achilles is good in a battlefield, but not in a classroom. Understand that? It's a very, very important point to note. There you are. So, but at the same time, you can see the senate of poets. Senate of poets means, you know, generally agree that they, they have specified, or somehow they have come to an agreement that the raiment for poetry is versing and rhyming. Raiment is an old word, but used here. Raiment. Raiment means clothing. The outward appearance is rhyming and versing. Why? It is to distinguish poetry from table talk and chance words. If you go to the canteen, your canteen, sit there and talk something, that cannot be poetry. So, somehow you have to distinguish poetry from table talk, informal talk, and also the chance words that you utter. Therefore, the senate of poets have decided, or they have voted in favor of uh, rhyming and verse. The point is to distinguish this. And the other is, they say, I am, but whatever I am, I am saying is poetry. Else. That cannot. Be. So what is what you have to do is poetry to uh, teach you to attract any any lesson you you want to teach should be attractive, and the poet teaches in the attractive way. And therefore, the making the point or the or the teaching attractive, he uses verse and uh, uh, rhyming. Suppose you are you you can teach without this, well and good. Without that, you can do that. As Saint Alphonse has done, was Herodotus has done. They can be done. Understand? He prose will do. See. In poetry, when you have got a rice and a rhyme and verse, each word, each syllable should be put in the appropriate place. The right word in the right place. So that what happens is easy for you to remember. And also when you see the right word in the right place, that is called diction, then automatically what you will do, you will be selecting words according to the dignity of the subject that you are treating. That's the point. For example, if you use slang words in Homer's Iliad, who would read it? It will, lose, it will have lost all its dignity. You won't be able to call it um, an epic. So that is the reason why this Senate of Poets have agreed, general agreement that we are seeing on the, it is for controlling, it is for limiting. It is for the right diction. It is for right measure. It is for the dignity of these subjects. So, if you, a poet should, or great poetry should, what is it? should purify your wit. Great poetry, one is purifying. Purifying wit. 
Understand? Purifying your bit means your mind, your ability to think, your brain, if you want to put it like that, or your heart. Second is a great poetry should enrich your memory. Enrich your memory. And third, a great poetry should be able to enable you to give the right judgment. Enabling enabling the right judgment. That is great poetry should be. And then enlarging of conceit. Enlarging of conceit. So these are the conceit means idea. I say idea, yes. So these are the four characteristics of great poetry. Great poetry should teach and the end will be purifying your wet with enriching your memory because you can easily remember these things, no? Enriching your memory easily. For example, who would ever forget to be or not to be? Or who would ever forget life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing? How, how brief can it? Or was this the face that launched a thousand ships and burned the top the stars of India and sweet hell and make me immortal with like this? That monosyllabic, that monosyllabic march, the march of monosyllables, used by exquisitely used by excellently used by Marlowe. Who would ever forget that? So it should enrich your memory. And then enabling the right judgment. So when you when you uh, study or when you go through great poems, it gives you some some uh, some uh, enlightenment to judge judge of things. Suppose somebody says, "Why in this old day you are working hard?" Then he can quote Odysseus, saying that. Something of noble not can yet be done, so that the judgment is passed. Something of noble not can yet be done, he says. Why should I sit idle? That is a kind of judgment, you know, on the remark of other person. Or enlarging of conceit. Uh, and he said, I think of what to, what to, what on, or what to the creation earn? So an idea is expanded. An enlargement of a conceit. Great words of John Keats. Written under the influence of the Greek writers. Said it. Thou unravished bride of quietness. From there the description begins. The enlargement of the conceit begins. So what happens there is, you have all this for in great poetry. So who can find fault with poetry and poets? Who told you that, which ignorant fellow told you that Plato had banished poets from his republic? Plato, Plato has never done that. Uh, that's the thing. And as you can see, his disciple Aristotle wrote a treatise on poetics, Aristotle's poetics that we have just now done. I have given 12 lectures on Aristotle's poetics covering all the aspects of Aristotle's poetics, from imitation to catharsis. Understand? So that's a, by, as a, it's a side remark, it's an aside you can say. In drama you have a aside, you know, so you can consider what I just now I said as an Yes, I understand. So, the poet ultimately, ultimately, what should the poet do? He should be, he should be able, or he should have that power to lift the divine essence in you out of the clay lodging, clay, C L A Y clay, because we are all made of say some mud, you know, yes. So, a clay lodging, he should be, a great poetry should be, or 
a great, great poetry will lift your divine essence that is hidden in your clay lodge. So your soul is lodged in, in a clay lodge, yes. A clay house, a house, house made of clay. That is the house, this is the house that Jack built. You know that sentence is like that. This is the house which is made of clay. But inside there is divine essence. And the, and the poet should be able to inspire you. His divine fancy should be such that it should inspire you and your divine essence you should be able to realize. It can be astronomy, it can be philosophy, natural or otherwise, supernatural. If you are interested in stars, you, you take up the study of you, your science or your branch will be astronomy. If you are interested in uh, natural secrets of nature and secrets of life and existentialism and so on, your, sub your subject is philosophy. That can be written in, in you can use verse, versing and rhyming there also. If you are interested in sounds and delight, you find sound and delight in sounds, then you are a musician. Look at that. These are all imitations, feigning. And if you are interested in certainty of demonstrations, then you can do mathematics. But however, whatever you do, there is a key word that you, you use. Uh, Sydney uses architectonic. 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 This is the word. Architectonic. Architectonic. What is architectonic means? Praxis. Praxis. What is praxis means? Practical application. Your knowledge, your concepts, your ideas. Say it may be in astronomy, it may be in philosophy, in natural philosophy, or supernatural, or metaphysics, or it can be mathematics, it can be music. It can be law, it can be history, any of this. You should not stay there at the point of knowing. No, that is gnosis, is it? gnosis. It should, from gnosis, it should go to praxis. What is gnosis means knowing, just knowing. And this is practical application. Practical application. Understand? So any knowledge, don't be satisfied at the level of, don't keep it at the level of knowing. For example, how many people might have read the parable of Good Samaritan? How the Good Samaritan looked after that Jew, took him to all those things, you know. How many of us are doing it? So there is a difference between knowing and doing. All those great religious texts, like the Bhagavad Gita, Mahabharata, Ramayana, the Bible, see that? the Holy Quran. So, you have got wonderful teachings in that. Then what about this? How many of you practice it? So, uh, Sir Philip Sidney says, it should not remain at the level of knowing. You have to put that into practice. If you want to put that into practice, you should be attracted towards the teaching. If you should be attracted towards the teaching, it should be given to you in a delicious manner. Only the poet can do that. This is the point. So this is how he uh, defines, he defends poesy. The ending end of all earthly learning is virtuous action. Very famous statement in that uh, essay. The ending end, the teleos. What is the ending end? Mentioned the last teleos in the in, in Greece, we you know. The end. What is the end? Teleos of man. Teleos of anything. Hmm? So that is, uh, 
ఈ నవంబర్ దాటి ఇన్ తీసే గీత్ అప్పటి తెలీ తెలీస్ వాట్ డి యూ వాంట్ టి తెలీస్ వాట్ డి యూ వాంట్ యువర్ ఎన్ టు బి చిల్డ్రన్ ఆస్ ద సిబిల్ టి తెలీస్ అండ్ దెన్ వాట్ ఇస్ ఈస్ అప్పటి తెలు మీన్స్ ఐ వాంట్ ద ఫైనల్ సెపరేషన్ అప్పటి మీన్స్ సెపరేషన్ so hello i want my end to be a separation from this world that is death tetelis what do you want your end to be answer is i want to die that is apatani telu so that is so what is the end of knowledge the ending end of all knowledge this is i am quoting from the text we can go through it the ending end ending end of all the ending end of all earthly learning that is it all earthly learning this is the exact words learning the ending end of all earthly learning what is it it is virtuous action it is virtuous action very important of our daily life practical life love your neighbor as yourself what a wonderful teaching how many of us will give a pen to a student sitting near near to you in the that you may give it that is in the exam hall when that the little man's pen goes on a strike without asking will you take you have got two will you take one and say hello you can use this if you do that this is what you say your knowledge is translated into action otherwise it will remain like a barren clouds it will be barren clouds in the sky unable to shower so your knowledge should be like clouds willing to shower understand this is what sydney says and for that you should be attracted and for getting attracted you should have what you call dulce and dulce is provided by wishing and arriving later you can see i have also given lectures on profess to little balance so there are verses also say the same thing you have to some or other way make it enjoyable or as cool you know the the primary it is dna written that all the living beings in this world are seeking pleasure all we, our actions are centered on pleasure seeking so if poetry does not give you pleasure it will not you will not be attracted by the teaching given in poetry and once you accept the teachings given in poetry sydney says don't stop it there but what should you do put that in the practice architect architectonic architectonic that is praxis from gnosis to prax praxis always of no use your learning is of no use understand you should practice yeah and then he says therefore therefore poetry is the prince of all knowledge or all arts the prince prince of all arts prince of all the rest of arts because you can see astronomy history philosophy mathematics law music these are serving sciences they are serving they are boring this like a a pot or a face is presented before you and you draw a picture but in this case this invention you are the poet is caught by the divine frenzy and then he invents and therefore in any way if you consider poesy it is the prince it is the king of all arts 
understand that. So this is what he said. This is how he he defends poetry. Don't you think the the defense is quite vigorous and very reasonable also? No? Tremendously reasonable, I should say. Tremendously reasonable. Because this is it's very logical. See? She says Versing and rhyming not necessary to become a poet. What is important is, for example, he gives examples of, see, the names of her daughters who wrote the romance, Theogenes and uh, Chaitlia, and also he has given the example of uh, Zenob and Cyrus. If he deem justi impidi. Then he says, it is generally accepted that you use rhyming and rhyming, but without that. Long gone will not make you a lawyer. If you plead in armor, nobody will say that you are not a lawyer. Long gone will not make you a lawyer. And at the same time, if you plead in armor, they will not say that if you your pleading is your pleading is logical and uh, and uh, it is fruitful, nobody will say that uh, you are not a lawyer. You can plead in armor. So and then and then you purify your wit. Your memory should you should enlighten your memory. You should be able to uh, expand a conceit. You should be able to judge properly. After after reading poetry. Or poetry should help you to do that. And then he says not only just do all these things but put this into practice. Architectonic. And for that you should be attracted. For attracting you, there is words. The right word in the right place is fiction. See, so you will be attracted to it. See, in the says very often I got this word, no? a thing of beauty is a joy for all. So you can remember it very easily. And it is a universal truth. So it will remain in your mind. It will enlighten you. It will enlarge it has enlarged the conceit. So the ending end of all art, whatever it is, like astronomy, etc., we have seen, it is virtuous action. Poetry leads you to virtuous action, and therefore, poetry is the prince of all other art. Poetry, poesy. Reigns as an emperor. Poe poesy reigns as an, an mighty, a mighty emperor. Because all the other sciences are serving sciences, while poesy is. Poesy tells you how a thing ought to be, how a thing may be how we think ought to be, and you can even use, as Dryden says in his essay, dramatic poesy, is a pleasing fallacy, you are allowed. The privilege of the poet to tell lies, says Aristotle. Pleasing fallacy, says John Dryden. That's why, see now in history, if you read history, you will find that Cyrus died on the battlefield. But Sanovan made him die in his bedroom of extreme old days. But it's no problem because that is pleasing fallacy. Pleasurable fallacy, you can fallacy, you can see. Or the art of telling lies. All what should be probable. All what is required is it should be probable. And therefore, to utile and uh, et dulce, the only art that that has got these two qualities inherent in it, that is poesy. Utile et dulce, therefore poesy reigns as the unquestioned. Nobody can question this. Understand? Nobody. The invincible, unquestioned, the dominating prince among all the arts.
I hope you have followed me. It's a very strong defense. Absolute. So this, there's no question of say any, any doubt. So I think that I have taken words from Sir Philip Sidney and I also have tried my best to defend poesy. Hope that you being students of literature, you will also defend poesy. Okay? So we will have the next lecture in the near future, the seventh one, the where we will be considering say moral philosophy, how does it affect history, how does it affect philosophy, how does it affect painting, how does it affect effect and so on. And so all the other arts are serving sciences, but poetry is a speaking picture to quote again Horace. So if you go through this essay, you will find it is, you have got, you, you, have, you will feel the live presence of Aristotle as well as Horace in this essay that is Apology for Poetry. Apology means defense. I hope that I have explained, it, explained this in my introduction. Okay, see you friends with another installment of Apology for Poetry. So in the near future. Till then, bye, have a nice time. Enjoy.